Hello everyone, and welcome to the Health Go Live webinar series. Thank you to all the sponsors of our Startup and Innovation series. We would like to remind everyone that the Q&A feature will be available, so feel free to send in those questions for the panelists throughout the discussion. And with that, I will throw it over to our moderator who joins us from Tegria, Ty Cook. Thanks for the, the intro, and we're excited to be here today. Um, we're going to discuss what we've learned over the last 20 months and, and how we're thinking about response to emergencies, how, how that's impacted um, the organization, you know, that the industry's ability to really respond to the needs that, that we face in, in the modern, you know, the modern healthcare arena. Um, I'm Ty Cook. I head up strategy and innovation for Tegria. Uh, Tegria is a uh, professional services and product company that is, is helping organizations really adjust and, and their operating model and maximize the technology that they've invested in. I'm joined today with a, a panel of, of just really um, great experts in this space. Um, we're thrilled to be here. I'm thrilled and, and, and humbled to be part of this group. Um, I'd like to introduce them. I'm going to start with Rhonda Wallen, who is the Chief Strategy Officer and Executive Vice President at Care Syntax. Rhonda, you want to tell us a little bit about yourself and your company? Sure. Thanks, Ty. Um, and uh, thanks for the uh, other panelists and for everyone for pulling us together today. So um, I'm with a company called Care Syntax. I am Chief Strategy Officer and Executive VP over technology and evidence. And what that means in particular is that I have responsibility for developing new business areas for the company around our platform and really um, looking at how we can use the data that we collect to improve outcomes, whether that's financial or operational or patient outcomes. Um, so at Care Syntax, our motto is, you know, we make surgery safer and smarter. And so really looking forward to, to discussing how um, we have shifted and how we have helped our customers shift during the pandemic. Thank you, Rhonda. I'd also like to introduce Chris Brand, who's the founder and CEO of Audacious Insight. Chris, you want to tell us a little bit more about yourself and your company? Good, thanks, Ty. Um, thanks for having me. Uh, so Chris Brandt, CEO of Audacious Inquiry. Um, our company enables care coordination. Uh, we route actionable patient information among hospitals, health plans, physician offices, and others to address the basic but critical challenge. Doctors often don't know when their patients are hospitalized, nor what happened during the hospital encounter. So, um, so while we live in a world where Amazon knows when I'm running out of paper towels, you know, doctors and care managers often don't know when their patients are receiving emergency or acute care. Uh, and they increasingly need to know uh, to ensure better outcomes for those patients. So in our execution of this work, you know, we've created the largest network of this kind, um, facilitating better coordinated care for over 70 million um, subscribed to Americans now. Uh, we, we've done this in partnership with some of the most influential healthcare organizations in the country, including uh, HHS, um, public health entities, and state Medicaid agencies across the U.S. You're welcome. And finally, I'd like to introduce Jim St. Clair, who's the Chief Trust Officer at Lumedic. Jim, you want to tell us a little bit more about yourself and your company? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Ty. Thank you for being here. I think if the measure of a man is the company keeps a uh, great measure with these fantastic panelists I'm joined with today and with your support. I'm the chief trust officer for Lomedic, which is also a Tegria company. We work cl closely with Providence Health Systems um, to deliver patient-centric solutions for interoperability, digital trust, and automation. Um, and of course, in this day and age, both post-pandemic as well as post-Cures Act, we see tremendous opportunities to try and work with patients to put solutions into their hands and in providers' hands to be able to better coordinate uh, their information, improve outcomes, and take advantage of the shift towards things such as virtual care, telehealth, and obviously by extension, the implications for emergency medicine and EMS services for interoperability. Well, thanks, Jim, and welcome. So let's get, let's get started. Um, and Rhonda, I'm gonna I'm gonna frame this first one for you. You know, historically, I think we've 
you've heard the world healthcare and it's, it's brought a certain, you know, kind of connotation up. And I'm curious if you've seen, you know, as we've gone or gone through the kind of those last 20 to 24 months, how, when you hear healthcare, how has that definition changed? How is, you know, the perspective you and your company have taken, you know, shifted, um, you know, given the experiences we've gone through? Yeah. So, at, at Care Syntax, you know, we're, we're really focused on the surgical suite. So when we looked at what was happening in surgery post-pandemic, what we noticed was there was an acceleration in the shift from the hospital setting to alternate sites of care. And so for us, that meant we have a growing population of ambulatory surgical centers who can also benefit um, from our services, but, but really are facing a growing volume of patients as care shifts from the hospital to, to their sites of care. So that's you know, something we were thinking about is, is how do we bring the efficiency measures and the efficiency metrics that we've been able to help our hospital-based providers leverage? How do we bring that to now a new care setting in the ambulatory setting as, as they are facing increased volumes? post-pandemic. That, that's really interesting. So, you know, you, we've heard about, you know, the acceleration of technology or models, like, you know, the adoption of virtual care being a prime example. But what I'm taking away from that is you're saying this also accelerated some of the other trends we had heard about, you know, the shift from inpatient to outpatient, for instance, and, and yeah. what, your, what your organization is seeing, you know, is, is more in that space. That's, that's great. Um, Chris, I know, I know your company, you know, probably went through a, a lot of change through, uh, through this, you know, over the course of the pandemic and managing it. How, how do you guys view that um, at Audacious? Sure, uh, absolutely. And, and similar to Rhonda, you know, we, you know, we've noticed also a shift in sort of the, the place and deliver where, where care is delivered. So, you know, our business is at its core is focused on, on, enabling better information flow during a patient's care journey, you know, especially during the transitions of care from one setting to a different setting. And um, that's sort of well proven to enable better quality outcomes, right? Both financial and, and, and care quality. And, um, you know, having worked on this problem for, for some time, we've learned that healthcare is not always provided you know, sort of under perfect conditions, right? And and uh, this is exacerbated during a pandemic. So, but, but for many patients, you know, their care journey would include a stop in a disaster shelter or, you know, or at a hospital that's experienced an overwhelming surge of patients. Um, sometimes facilities are damaged or patients are displaced. Sometimes there's not enough resources for everyone. And so, you know, what, one of the things we've also recognized is these patients can, can still receive informed high quality care and so, you know, for example, we've learned to leverage our technology um, know-how and, and data networks to provide medication and clinical history in a shelter setting, you know, during a disaster, right? Um, and, and as another example, we're, we're leading an effort, the Saner, the Saner project, right, to extend the processes of regular care delivery to systematically enable better resource allocation during, during a state of emergency. Um, you know, sort of taking, taking a step back on the definition of healthcare, I think building on what you and Rhonda were talking about, it, it's clear that the definition continues to broaden, right? It, it's a, there's a broader set of inputs to patient and person well-being. And, uh, you know, for us, you know, we're, we're just, we're sort of focused on improving every patient's care journey, no matter how sort of regular or, or irregular it may be. Oh, that's excellent. Thanks. And Jim, you know, your, your company Lumetic, I think is, you know, has, has been kind of squarely rooted in some of the response and, and, and helping, you know, that broader community in many ways, think about how to, how to get back, you know, back into whatever the, the normal is going to look like for them. You want to expand on, on kind of how you guys have viewed that from your perspective? <clears throat> Absolutely. And I think I'd tee off of some of the things that Rhonda and Chris were saying that, uh, you know, at, at, at a macro level, the pandemic has accelerated this consideration for what it means to care for a patient and not just traditionally within the, the healthcare organization provider's office sort of setting. 
And, you know, that means new technology, you know, technologies in telehealth that have existed for years um, that, uh, that we're only kind of beginning to, to get on the cusp of uptake, you know, got uh, tremendous immediate consideration. Um, and then from there, very rapidly, the consideration of beyond just telehealth, meaning, you know, talking like we are in a Zoom setting, but issues of remote patient monitoring, virtual care, mobile apps, wearables, things that allowed the patient to, uh, first of all, collect and manage their own data, uh, as well as that being a virtual extension of the sorts of, of uh, diagnostics and information that might be gathered in a traditional setting. And so it was no longer just kind of a one and done. I stop by my doctor, he runs some tests, I get some information, I disappear for 30 days and then they see me again. Um, but, but is there a continue, an opportunity for continuous monitoring, an opportunity for uh, continuous data sharing? And, and how does the patient now sit at the middle of that where they now present themselves to the doctor when they can uh, and have this host of information available to them? And are there non-traditional aspects? As Chris noted, is it now going to uh, you know, a temporary shelter site? Is it going to an offsite uh, ad hoc clinic location? Um, but again, tying back into a centralized EHR or some other system that that patient, uh, patient's information can be, can be retained and paints a whole new picture of that, in, of that patient and their information and provides a new continuous source of feedback for that information in kind of a new virtual world. And I think we're now starting to consider that more post-2020 and into 2021. Oh, that's excellent. Uh... You know, this next Chris, this next question, you know, Chris, I may, I may start off with you a little bit, you know, for instance, at our company, you know, last April, we got some calls out there and somebody said, Hey, we're giving you all our virtual care patient calls, have them, you know, we need help. We, we, we just need to, you know, figure out how to, to, to keep as much moving as we can. And, you know, we had to figure that out. And now, now this time, I think we've actually turned that into a service we can provide uh, more proactively and, you know, and, and with a, a little more structure around it. I'm just curious, kind of how is your organization viewing, you know, the capabilities, what, what you're doing to help organizations as they look to weather this next kind of wave? Um, how, how are you guys thinking about that? And, and where, where do you feel like you're better prepared this go around to help help your customers? Sure. I, I mean, I, you know, sort of right away, we, you know, you know, during the pandemic, right? We, we learned we had to adapt our, our existing, you know, networks and core technologies to provide sort of pandemic oriented alerts, right? So for example, through June, I think that was north of 20 million patients uh, on our network who had tested positive for the virus. And, and we sent uh, an alert, whether it's to the payer or to a public health organization to enable, you know, contact tracing or a, a timely follow-up um, for like payers that had a, a rapid response or an outreach team, right? And, um, you know, that, that sort of, that was an example of sort of leveraging what we have to, to, to handle um, the, the situation. Um, I think we also, uh, the, the, and sort of the other sort of big visible effort was more of a, hey, we recognize a broader need across the country for understanding bed availability, right? Bed capacity. And so our team jumped in there. We have a, a policy team and a, and, um, a, a, you know, a group that, that was able to um, come together there with, with key partners and help, to, help to, to assemble some really amazing partners. And the SANER project emerged. And, and SANER is an acronym, but it's a, it's a grassroots collaboration among sort of federal and state agencies, as well as, you know, you know, Epic and Cerner leading and, and other you know, sort of leading health information technology organizations that are really focused on the way hospital capacity reporting is done across the country. And so, you know, we're facilitating an evolution of modern interoperability standards. So it's how the data is communicated to enable, you know, public health leaders to understand which hospitals and healthcare facilities have or need more staffing or more beds or ventilators or other critical resources during, during a disaster or an emergency. And Rhonda, at Care Syntax, how, how are you looking at this, you know, kind of this next period and, and taking incorporating lessons learned uh, from the past? Yeah, so, you know, I, I love what Chris just said about how the company had to, to adapt their services and what they were offering. 
um, adaptability is, is kind of the key word that I focus on for our customers as well. So for our customers, what they experienced as a result of the pandemic was a 35% reduction in surgical volume in, in just four months, which represents, more importantly, several billion dollars in lost revenue. So you have many patients opting to cancel or delay surgeries, and then there's a significant backlog. So, so one of the ways we helped them was to, to develop a playbook based on the analytics that we can provide for operations in and around the surgical suite for really how, what, are, what is the fastest way that you can start addressing this backlog, right? And what's the, what's the best way for you to maintain um, as, as many cases per day as you can, given the very large shifts in the patient mix and in the day-to-day caseload that, um, that you're seeing that's very different than pre-pandemic. So the lesson that we took is that if we can help our, our customers operate at a higher level of efficiency, they'll be able to schedule more cases and continue their operations, which then allows them to minimize the impact um, on on their revenue generating activities. And Jim, how how is Lumetic, you know, viewing viewing the current time and and where you guys fit in, um, you know, to better, to kind of better navigate these waters this, this time? Absolutely. And I want to jump on what Rhonda was indicating about uh, improving efficiencies, concepts of automation and the like. And I think um, with the continued impacts of the pandemic, as she was saying, it's a great opportunity if, if there can be said, you know, an opportunity in the midst of the tragedy to recognize that, you know, it's all about frontline care delivery and enabling and streamlining that process. And I think we're all recognizing the degree to which care delivery, frontline healthcare workers, um, uh, and their efforts are exacerbated by the, the underlying inefficiencies and, and processes that we subject in healthcare, either intentionally or unintentionally. I think all of us would expect that, you know, two organizations working together or working across state lines, there's various challenges in communication, regulatory frameworks and the like. But golly, just getting paperwork through or resolving issues of insurance and, of course, the lifeblood of just revenue management, revenue cycle management. Um, all are screaming out for different ways for improvement and process automation and uh, revisiting and transforming prior authorizations, et cetera, that just get you know, the business, in air quotes, aspects of healthcare done better that, that alleviate burdens and help streamline and improve the efficiencies for the frontline healthcare workers to do their job, whether pandemic related, whether, as Rhonda pointed out, the tangential impact, unfortunately, of of non-pandemic cases and being able to get uh, 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 elective surgeries or other procedures, uh, all of that is, I think, ripe, and we perceive that as ripe areas for improvements to be able to focus more on the, the, the tactics of care delivery. Well, you, you've all, you've all kind of hit on different points too, and Jim, I may, I may come back to you here in a second, but. You know, part of, of what we're seeing is, is one, the, the scope of how we view healthcare has expanded. The impact obviously is felt very deeply and, and we've, we're, we're managing that better um, right now. But how has that also impacted how you view partners and, and groups that you need to engage um, to help solve the problems um, with your customers in, in more comprehensive or compelling ways? Maybe Jim, you want to? I'd love to. I would. I, yeah, I'd love to jump in on that and thank you, Ty, because it happens to relate to conversations I've had as late as this morning. Um, you know, everyone is familiar, of course, with the with the new movement around. I just call it a new movement around social determinants of health. New in the sense that uh, you know whether whether motivated through the pandemic or just by virtue of stimulated conversations and virtual meetings. Um, you know, we've had both an uptick of consideration of social determinants of health in terms of factors, considerations for patients and patient care, um, the, the, the work of the HL7 Gravity Project, which I, I dabble in, in actually defining um, clinical data elements around social determinants of health. And, and then uh, beyond that, uh, looking more and more at how, say, standardized clinical data, HL7 FHIR and, and so forth and so on, 
can relate to um, new foundations and standardized data for social determinants of health. So, so with both the pandemic exacerbating SDOH factors and economic security, housing security, et cetera, and how those factor into clinical decision-making and where that information should, should reside is, is in my opinion and in, in my experiences with some of the standards and consortia groups, beginning to bring together new discussions between participants that normally wouldn't have been talking to one another about information around uh, you know, the background and socioeconomic conditions of the individual as a factor of clinical data and clinical outcomes and evidence-based medicine. Um, and that certainly factors in from an emergency standpoint. You know, one of the, uh, the challenges is, and I'm sorry, I can't cite it, but I was just reading the other day, the percentage of, uh, of rural hospitals that are depending on their emergency systems and how uh, EMS systems uh, represent uh, significantly different healthcare delivery networks in rural environments versus what they do in urban environments. And a lot of that has to do just with the level of penetration of the availability of medical facilities, critical access hospitals and the like, and how, you know, much like in a DOD defense setting, um, the front line of care is delivered by EMS in various socioeconomic SDOH type environments. And that's changing the conversation for how information is collected and data elements that are involved with it, I think. Well, Chris, how, how are you viewing that for, from your lens and your perspective? <clears throat> Sure. In terms of the relationships and part partnerships, I mean, you know, during COVID, we saw right, more demand for reporting and data sharing with, you know, health departments and federal agencies, you know, more demand for data sharing, information sharing among hospitals and health systems that typically may not prefer to share data with, you know, particularly with their, you know, competition or otherwise. And, and then, and more data from entities other than hospitals, like immunization registries, labs, et cetera, right? So, um, you know, we initiated the, San the SANER project to create, you know, visibility on, on hospital and critical resource capacity, you know, et cetera. Um, and and that, I guess that's an example of, of new, like, you know, we, there were a lot of new partners for us involved in that, um, you know, standards organizations like EHRA and HL7, uh, vendors like Lidos, Lantana, Lantana, Esri, and then, you know, Cerner Epic, EHR vendors we've worked with, and CDC, ONC, U.S. Digital Services, et cetera. And so, you know, um, I, I suppose I would say, you know, kind of similar to a point um, I think Rhonda made earlier, which is like, you know, people can come together around, you know, around a crisis. And, and so there are new partnerships that have emerged that are, are likely to endure as a function of of the, the emergency. Well, I know we, you know, we saw too that that the you know building back to kind of that definition change of healthcare, but that you know there were areas in, in probably businesses where health became much more of a, a prevalent understanding of them to be able to operate. You know, hospitality being a pretty a pretty good example of that. And and Chris, you know, the point you bring up about people needing more information, more data. You know, we see that as an, an ongoing opportunity for us to help support communities um, and kind of extend extend the care that's traditionally been, you know, kind of owned and the burden even borne by the, the health system serving a particular community or region, you know, that, that we can help extend that in different ways um, with programs, with data sharing. Um, that's certainly been, been a big lesson learned for us through this. And Rhonda, you know, it's, it's interesting. I'll, br I'll bring it back to you to, and curious your comments on this. You know, a lot of the stuff that Jim and Chris talked about was kind of, you know, uh, you know, the moving more to the periphery. And it's interesting, though, you talk about the importance of the surgery suite of, of how that, you know, is, is a driver to kind of keep the lights on for a lot of health systems. And, you know, and you see the downstream impact. Are you, I'm just curious, how are you seeing conversations with, the folks that you're chatting with at your customers, you know, are they starting to see how that gets connected? I'm just curious if, you know, where, where you're seeing those, those conversations land. Yeah. So, you know, I, I'm drawn to, um, to our relationship with one of our partners, since we were just talking about partnering um, with the American board of surgery. And I think one of the things that they liked about our solution was that we're bringing 
data into the service of creating standards and bringing more um, modernization really around how do you, in their case, credential surgeons, how do you um, bring, bring together information in a rapid and efficient way so that they can leverage it to, to get more people through their process. So I think that's one of the things the pandemic put in very sharp relief is that we need to have systems and structures in place that allow us to more rapidly respond or, or, or allow us to keep, our, keep the lights on. Um, and, and when you're stuck in kind of manual processes, that you're, you're just not going to be able to, to respond and adapt as, as well as you could be. So that's a theme that, that we've seen, you know, obviously with our partner, uh, American Board of Surgery, but, but when we look at our hospital partners, I think they also are, are looking for other ways to just kind of bring, bring more visibility around the key processes that they use in delivery of healthcare. And so, you know, we're, we're one small part of that within the surgical suite, but we are bringing together a lot of data that enables analysis to then get you to, to do the most efficient and with the best outcomes, processes, and procedures that you can. Well, and you, you really hit on a, a great point. I'm, I'm curious, you know, Chris, how, how you see this from, from your perspective, but this concept of there's an element of, of more of a safety net that we put in place now and in some, you know, some kind of Fault, faults that we can trigger, you know, along the lines to try to, to stem some of the triage or the, you know, the impact that an organization feels. You know, Chris, I'm curious from where you sit, you know, how, how do you see what Audacious is doing, contributing kind of that safety net concept? Sure. Yeah. So, um, you know, at, at Audacious Inquiry, I mean, this is really what we do every day, right? Our, our solutions are focused on supporting physicians by, by getting the basics right on enabling care transitions and care continuity. Um, and that, you know, that's sort of making sure that each member of a patient's care team has actual, accurate, and timely information. And so our investment in providing a safety net for, for clinicians and their patients in disaster situations is sort of an example of how we've extended it. But it's, you know, the, the premise is, you know, you know we've got a, Ultimately, like we've got this set, this set of, of solutions that should be sort of raising the bar a little bit on how care, on the standard of care and how it's delivered, whether that's um, you know, during a public health emergency or, or just sort of in, in day-to-day care, right? Because the informa- timely actionable information is now, is now available. And Jim, how do you view that? How's Lumetic viewing kind of their role in, in being that safety net for your customers or the Well, patient? that's a great question. And, the, you know, Ty, as you know, well know with our involvement with Providence, Providence Health Systems is a tremendous footprint that encompasses a tremendous range of both uh, not only traditional commercial health care and, and, or health organizations, as well as, uh, you know, ambulatory surgical centers, et cetera, but also community hospitals. So, the diversity of those organizations and what their respective needs and challenges are for their population uh, is quite complex. And, uh, you know, factoring in that that safety net consideration, um, I think that there's some challenges in in many healthcare solutions being offered because they're aimed at a certain market. Um, You know, they're aimed at the large healthcare system. They're aimed at the the more expensive surgical center, but yet community hospitals, safety net organizations, and you know, speaking from a rural perspective, um, uh, 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 the community access hospitals, those provide tremendous levels of care to a significant population. Uh, they lack the staff and the capability as well as just the resources to adopt very expensive solutions or, or large monolithic implementations. So are there simpler technical tools that we can enable them with process automation, um, um, capabilities for um, uh, simpler analytics and and dashboards that help them make better, uh, more tactical determinations on challenges with revenue cycle, with billing and denials, with the ability to accrue revenue that is literally keeping the lights on while delivering care in a small setting with a small dedicated cadre of healthcare workers. 
uh, for a population that critically needs it. So we've talked a little bit about, you know, kind of how your, your companies are, are helping be part of these response plans, um, how, you've, how you've adjusted kind of your, your approach, um, both out of necessity and, and out of opportunity um, to, to really meet the needs more clearly. I'm curious, as you look, you know, we start to look forward a little bit, what are the barriers you see, you know, that you think are, are still really important for the industry to, to focus on, to, to work, work over or around? Um, maybe Rhonda, if you're willing to start us off there and give us your perspective. Sure. So, you know, I, I kind of viewed this a bit differently. I think our providers are, are facing not so much barriers, but, but challenges. Um, you know, I, I view a barrier as something that uh, is, you know, very directly in front of you. Challenge is, is a bit more amorphous, but still something you have to get through. Um, one of the ones that's front and center for, for our customers are payer negotiations and delivering care under risk sharing agreements and the new value-based contracting arena. So we help them tackle those challenges in, in a couple of different ways. So from the provider standpoint, we are using the analytics within the OR to help hospital administrators use surgical resources more efficiently. For our physician customers and users, um, we're really helping them benchmark what they're doing and understand if you know how how far off they are from an exemplar um, procedure, the the performance of that procedure in the best way, um, and. You know, procedural success, it's, it's a very uh, short-term measure, but it really is very highly correlated with patient outcomes. So, so that's another area that we're looking at. And finally, for payers, um, you know, the 800-pound gorilla in, in our healthcare mix, it's really about helping them understand the risks and opportunities around specific surgical procedures. And then that then helps them to design more tailored policies for their providers. So we're, we're really trying to tackle that piece of the, the healthcare picture. And that's, that's the biggest barrier, frankly, that, that our hospitals are, are seeing that, that we can help with. How about Jim, how, how, are you, how are you viewing that at Lumetic? Great question. And I think I'd take a, a slightly macro view. You know, it's exciting to see the infrastructure bill going through Congress because Time and again, whether in rural settings or even in, in, in larger uh, healthcare organization settings, access to the internet, uh, both within the organization as well as access to the internet on the part of, uh, of patients um, still remains a challenge that's being defined. Uh, AHRQ had a, a real good uh, graphical survey that they put out about two, three weeks ago um, where they were highlighting internet access as a factor of social determinants of health highlighting those percentage of the populations that had access to high-speed internet, um, that percentage of the population that had computers in their house, uh, that percentage of the population that only accessed the internet via their phone, uh, and then lastly, just considerations of where the availability of 4G, 5G networks are consistently in the U.S. And I think both the Lumetic solutions as well as, uh, as the solutions from Audacious Inquiry and Care Syntax and the like are all starting to work in that category where internet access is key. I, I was just having a discussion a little bit earlier where around uh, Lumetic Connect's uh, identity solutions where it's based on, on, on mobile wallets and mobile credentials. And you know, one of the first questions that get raised with populations as well, you know, using mobile solutions, does that introduce inequity? Not necessarily, and there's a, a very strong argument that there is uh, extensive penetration of mobile devices in a lot of communities uh, where no other forms of internet or computer access exist, but, but having consistent, reliable uh, uh, access to the internet for a range of services, not just from your mobile device, but for telehealth and virtual care. You know, can my mobile device support remote patient monitoring solutions? What about the wearables I have? All of those are considerations that are beyond from just the healthcare organization or the State Department of Health, but move into the FCC and investments in, in high-speed broadband and 5G and other technologies such as that. 
it, it's another aspect where there's a whole nother technology component that is outside the HHS realm of consideration uh, that has to be looked at for what we're considering this next generation of healthcare and how do our solutions and solutions from others fit into that to be able to support patients and not generate any forms of inequity in doing so. Uh, that, that's great insight, Jim. Thanks for, thanks for bringing that to the panel. And, you know, Chris, I think you guys have scaled, you know, you've, you've done some scale in, in, in a very impressive, you know, fashion. How, again, how do you see, you know, the, the, the challenges or, or, or the, you know, the, the, however you would frame kind of what needs to continue to be changing or evolving to continue to bring that type of scale more broadly to the industry? Sure. I mean, I, I think that the conversation around health and well-being is going to be a national conversation for a while, right? And um, and it's a great conversation to have. And I think it's the scope of that conversation is expanding. To me, I think the biggest barrier and the thing that will unlock and is unlocking um, real advancement is is changes in incentives, right? Um, you know, it, it's such a huge problem. You know, you're thinking about, you know, the health of a community. And, and there's so much that goes into it. You know, I think Jim mentioned social determinants and, and, and that, what is that? Like, you know, just healthcare alone is huge, but now you add this and it's like housing and transportation. And the, so, you know, it's, it's massive, but there is a lot of, there's a, like the health, Healthcare, healthcare organizations have, have the opportunity to play a quarterback role on some of this stuff. And, and um, I think the incentives are shifting to enable that. And, and so what we've seen, you know, we have, you know, 1,100 or so hospitals connected. They're different sizes from academic to rural and, and you, know, you know, thousands of subscribing organizations of different size, payers, big, big payers, small payers, doctor's offices, SDOH type organizations that have a patient rate relationship. And one of the things we've noticed is that our most active users tend to be those on the most innovative end of sort of trying to thrive in a value-based care kind of environment where they have the incentive to proactively reach out to a patient as opposed to just care about them when they're right in front. And the impact of that in terms of quality and cost, total cost is substantial, right? It's, it's, it's this looking at the patient on a more, you know, sort of a, you know, taking a broader look as opposed to the episodic view. Um, and, and the incentives are, are just, are sort of slowly getting there. Well, and I, I wanna also kind of close the, the, the moderated part of this, um, looking a, a little bit more through a, a you know, a positive or a positive lens, so to speak. You know, I think we've seen the industry rise to the occasion, um, you know, and, and, and are those, those frontline workers rise to the occasion every day, they continue to do it. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm curious though, what do you, what do you see as the opportunity though? You know, I mean, Chris, you started to untease that a little bit. Maybe I'll come back to you, you know, and, and have you expand on the concept of, of where this could go. Um, you know, if, if we can kind of ride the momentum, can, can, can continue to, you know, to, to, to not get worn down when it's easy to get worn down or revert to kind of old habits, what, you know, what do you see that opportunity leading toward if we can achieve some of those, you know, some of those, work through some of those challenges that you outlined? I mean, sure. Look, I, I'm an entrepreneur, right? And, and I've, I have a, a survivorship bias, right? So like, you know, like I, we've had some success and have grown a great company that has you know, great impact. So I, I tend to look, maybe I have a little bit rose colored glasses, but, you know, for the 15 years or so that I've been working in, you know, this interoperability community where, you know, at the beginning, people just look at you sideways because sideways, there've been so many failed efforts at this, right? And, um, you know, seeing it now where we are, there's a lot of progress. You know, there's a long way to go, but there has been a lot of progress. So I do have a very optimistic view of where we're headed. Um, you know, I, we talk about patient-centered care. We've been talking about patient-centered care for a very long time. And, and we're really seeing it now. I think more, like it's still, 
pockets, right? And, and they're and I think they they tend to emerge particularly where the incentives are right. But um, but but we've seen a lot of progress. I think going forward, we're going to see more focus upstream, right? So it's the nutrition, it's the it's the stuff before you're in the emergency department, um, the causes of those acute and adverse events, and then um, you know I think you know, continuing to think about the care journey more holistically, including like the, the uh, encounters in unusual location or during an emergency, during a crisis, because we seem to be in crisis a lot of the time, you know, like I think, I think that's going to continue to be a, a theme and we're going to have more resilience for that. And then I guess lastly, I'd say, you know, I'm excited for the future of an American healthcare system that continues to sort of raise the bar on quality, efficiency, and equitable delivery, right? Um, so we're, but, but, and not lose sight of this, this reality that we are, we're still facilitating and rewarding innovation, which has made the American system really the best in the world as far as we are on, our, on ourselves. And Rhonda, how, you know, again, what are you excited about? You know, or what, where do you see the, the opportunity or the, you know, the, the optimistic view of, of where we can land if, if we can, you know, turn what's been a very difficult situation into momentum that we can continue to to ride yeah i i just want to key off of what chris was saying about interoperability and connectivity i think the pandemic brought a lot of those more digital innovations to the forefront and i think that's part of the larger story about the modernization and digitization of healthcare and health records and data. And what excites me is the ability to bring together all of this data and, and really understand how do we use it to improve quality, to improve outcomes. So there's a particular initiative called NEST that the government's working on to, to help us leverage real world data now that we have more structured ways of collecting it and analyzing it and bringing together the relevant bits from claims, from the EHR appropriately de-identified. Um, and, and in our case, you know, the, all of the other data that you can get within the surgical suite, but really being able to bring together all of this data and understand in a real world setting after a device or a procedure has been approved, that's great, but how does it perform for everyday patients, for everyday surgeons out in the real world. So I think that that broader digital digitization um, of, of healthcare data is really gonna enable a lot of step change or maybe greater than step change improvements in the delivery of care. And Jim, how do you see it? Absolutely. Yeah. Chris and Rhonda brought up some good points. Uh, I would say with some of the standards and consortia bodies I'm involved in, we'd like to say that the future will be decentralized. Uh, and that means various things about architecture. But I think to the points that Chris and Rhonda was making, um, that the consideration of healthcare consumerism isn't just about being able to go and shop for healthcare like you do at, at, uh, uh, at Target. It's really about considering the patient and the patient first in the same way that so many other industries focused on consumer experience. What is the experience that they're having? How am I reaching out to them? Are there means of communications that I should be using that I don't traditionally do uh, to talk to them and reach them you know, at their level or from their perspective that are all aimed towards contributing towards more efficient processes, better coordination of care, and where are the sources of data that I can, I can use to do that? How do I consider new ways of allowing the patient to control or share that information? What are aspects of privacy and consent that I haven't considered? Because now factors of gender identification, factors of, of, of sexual orientation and the like are now sensitive issues at the forefront of how patients are treated but they're also regarded with a great deal of sensitivity and should be shown you know, different models for consent. All of those are, are things I would offer that there are other consumer experience models for in other industries that in healthcare just, just haven't been there. And, and despite uh, you know, ongoing concerns about emergency treatment and where we are with, uh, with pandemic response, 
how many of these things are, are, are laying the groundwork for consideration as we go forward in a new data enabled perspective on decentralized care delivery. You know, in some cases, a decentralization that came about because it has to. Well, let's move from beyond it has to to something that we want to do because we can demonstrate better, more efficient ways to care for the patient in doing so. Oh, I think it's fascinating you, because I'll brought up a couple different things, you know, that we've, we've certainly been thinking a lot of certainly the, you know, on one end, there's this, this new tech, you know, kind of e almost era that we're entering into, we're interoperability, we're data, you know, things that we can do today that we, you know, five to 10 years ago really weren't realistic, we can do, um, you know, I think we've seen that patient behavior maybe isn't kind of what we've always thought it would be. Um, and, you know, and, and that, that becoming more focused on the patient, looking at them when they're not necessarily in that patient state, more in their, you know, their, their non-sick state maybe is, is one way to think about it or outside of the traditional healthcare system. You know, I think that allows us to push these models to think about partners, think about who we need to bring together to solve these problems. And you know, in a much more real way, and and that those are some of the lessons we have. So I think you guys hit on all of that. It was just fantastic. I wanna I wanna thank you guys for uh, for bringing your insights and your perspectives, your expertise. Um, we would like to open it up for questions. If you're um, in the Zoom meeting, you can find in your kind of your your um, toggle bar uh, a Q and A. And if you would like to type any questions, uh, we we'd love to have Rhonda. Chris and Jim, you know, field them uh, accordingly. While we're waiting for a few questions to come in, what what else do you see, you know, today, or what other questions would or or, or thoughts have you had, you know? recently that you think might be pertinent for, you know, for this group that we didn't necessarily, you know, frame through some of the questions we've asked so far. Are there any other, you know, comments you guys would like to make or, or you know, kind of opine on? One thing I would add to stitch back to what Rhonda was saying about value-based care is I don't think we can miss the opportunity, and I think Chris and Rhonda have spoken to this as well, that some of these new patient incentivization models, some of these new concepts for care delivery, factoring SDOH, those all improve efficiencies and improving efficiencies is exactly where value-based care is going. Um, some people in the audience may be familiar with the direct contracting entity models that, that CMS was uh, beginning to work towards in the previous administration and before the pandemic that I think will be revisited which are ultimately driving towards, you know, capitated payments as the next generation beyond value-based care. Those models won't work if you don't do things like uh, uh, other industries, in my perspective, to improve the consumer experience and improve the efficiency and the use of the information you have at hand. And I think that's part of that brave new world to be considered going forward too, just my thought. Chris, we had a question come in. It was. They're curious to know how we would address the automation of care coordination while not getting rid of that human connection that helps motivate the, the, the individual, you know, that ultimately we're trying to help. Sure. So um, it's a great, it's a great point. And in fact, um, and I, I'm going to build a little bit, I think, on what, on, on Jim's comment around consum consumerism and sort of you know, healthcare sort of adopting some of the best practices of customer satisfaction, patient satisfaction, right? And and one of the things that I learned, from, so I'm not a doctor, I'm, I'm a computer science guy, I went, you know, a business doctor, right? But I've been working in this community for long enough to understand that, you know, healthcare is very personal. And like expecting, I, I'm of the camp that, we're not going to replace the personal touch in healthcare with um, just an automated system or robots or alerts. You know, I think you know we're trying to arm the human, you know, caregiver with information so that they can engage 
And uh, by way of an example, who's at, you know a, a friend who I knew through a, through an Aspen, through the Aspen Institute Fellowship runs a company called Iora Health, and they're they're sort of a retail oriented primary care practice that takes risk and has a, you know they're focused on delivering care for the patients, and they have had great experiences by enabling these health coaches, right? That are that are um, not necessarily clinicians, but they're armed with you know, the right kind of background, the personable background, and they're armed with information and supervised by clinicians, right, to, to help um, and they help patients, right? Like help, like, hey, Mrs. Smith, how are you, how are you doing today? You know, just checking in periodically with the chronically ill. And it, it has this tremendous impact on the outcomes, both the cost and the quality of care over, over, over a time. And I think you know, my sense is, is that those kind of models, and you see them with, you know, these other sort of innovative companies, and Kaiser, you know, that had, has, you see, you see outcomes that are, are um, not, they're, they're tech enabled, but they're not just um, automation and, and uh, absent the human connection that you mentioned, Scott. Yeah, and Ty, if I could add to Chris's comments on, on automation, we're involved with various process automation efforts uh, with healthcare, and I was involved with it in the public sector before coming to Lamedic. And one of the things we told our customers is, you know, you can't just automate a bad process. So you have to, you know, make sure that your processes are optimized first and foremost, and that you are using standardized data formats. So just as an example, even before getting into automation for care coordination, um, we're involved, Providence is involved in a lot of efforts around HL7 standards that are standardizing coordination of care and exchange of information first and foremost, and, and that are ripe then for other processes and automation to be included that just make the flow of information more efficient. Because I think we all recognize as members of the industry, as well as patients ourselves, a lot of times the biggest hassle is, why am I here, but my information isn't yet? And why couldn't this information have been there before? And that's a matter of standardized processes and better information exchange and using HL7 standards as ways to do that. And, and, and progress is certainly being made there, I think. There's a question. What do, we, what do we think the hospital of the future looks like? You know, a, a nice little easy scope one for us there. But, uh, you know, maybe I, maybe I can start and, and tee it up and then, you know, certainly the rest of the panelists feel free to, to add in or chime in as you see fit. You know, I, I, our take is, you know, the hospital of the future is going to continue to push more and more care outside of the hospital um, where appropriate. And I, and I think, you know, that's going to result in more layers of, of triage that, you know, certainly technology will play a part in, but it's also going to be in, in actually having that technology enable the caregivers with these really you know specific skill sets and expertise um, to do to do more um, and not burden them you know that that's kind of what we generally see happening um, you know I think it's going to be a while there's always probably going to be some need for an inpatient setting of some you know of some sort um, you know surgical suites etc the you know, you think in terms of, of the, the sterilization requirements, et cetera, that's going to be hard to move um, into a home, you know, where, but, but I think we will see more and more capabilities uh, move as, as the technology advances. I was, you know, I was talking with a cardiologist and they said, you know, once we can get a really good blood pressure uh, remote monitoring tool out there, that opens up a world of cardiovascular disease management that can really be done in more of a remote setting. So, you know, we see those types of things being, being adopted, but ultimately it's kind of moving that triage more and more closer to the patient, closer to the individual, um, using a combination of technology and processes. <clears throat> yeah, and just to, to um, opine further, <laughs> when, I, when I think about the hospital of the future, I think very much about the technologies that all three of us are, are working on. Um, I think about Chris's work in, in coordinating the patient pathway and having all of the information about where that patient has been and what they've experienced available. Um, I think about the work that Lumetic is doing and making sure that we have 
standards that say, yes, this is how you track what has happened and this is how you record it. And th these are the places you will be able to find this data. And then I think about the work that Care Syntax is doing in bringing standardized processes and procedures and assessments and, and efficiency metrics and, and bringing together all of the data that heretofore has been slowly making its way around other areas of the hospital, but bringing that all into the surgical suite and making sure that all of the quality improvements and, and you know, best practices and work, work order sets that, that flow from um, a given patient experience is, is available everywhere in the hospital and, and not just in, in certain areas according to, you know, maybe one or two physicians who are really on top of it, but it will be broadly available to all patients who come in the door. And then we'll be able to have those predictive analytics, which again, based on data, that can look at the patient and say, oh, okay, so you are a patient that does this, this, and this, and you've also been treated here, there, and there, and you also had this surgery that resulted in that and this, therefore we know exactly how to treat you, and guess what, bada bing, bada boom, you're in and out in one day, and you can finish your care at home, and you're healed. <laughs> I would, on the hospital of the future, I would, I would just teach, add just a little, you know. So I serve on on the you know the board of a of an of an, a leading advanced community hospital in, in Baltimore, and it has been a wonderful experience to learn. And those are extremely complex organizations. Like it, you know, it's really remarkable uh, the work they do. And it's you know, there's a cult the, the culture as it should be, right? Is is don't break anything. Like just like. We gotta just and they and and this hospital in particular has is the best community hospital in the state and they win a, awards for their quality of care, the delivery mechanism, which begins at admission and ends at discharge. And so it's very interesting to see the shift in focus beginning, you know, hey, what what if they're not here? You know, and and frankly, I think hospital hospitals have trusted brands, right? And so like you think about. These are some of the most trusted organizations in healthcare with some of the smartest people in healthcare and, and they have resources and they have the role, the opportunity to be the quarterback. So I like, you know, I think there is, um, I think there's a great future for hospitals, even as they shift more of the things that should be performed outside of the, the walls of the hospital outside. So. Yeah, Chris, you make a really good point there that, you know, the, the role of the hospital can be in, in making sure the standards, the protocol, you know, like that there's a, that, that that clinical expertise is almost brought to bear as we extend capabilities further, you know, further outside the walls. Um, that's a great, that's a great point. Um, on a related note, the last, there was another question about how, what's the timeline for some of this interoperability? And I think, you know, you know, Jim, you and you and Chris probably both have some some really good thoughts on kind of the timeline for this. You know, if we're as we move to this and we see interoperability being um, kind of a critical a critical path item, where where do you guys see this from a timeline perspective? Absolutely, and I know that uh, Chris and Rhonda and myself have been involved in this for years. Chris did a great summary before about how just over the last 10 years, it's kind of slogged through the mud. I, I would say all of us, including the attendees, recognize that there are still you know, barriers and technical challenges with information exchange. But from my perspective, and, and especially what I'm doing on a day-to-day -day basis now, the first challenge we see isn't technical or architectural. It's rather that we've evolved the technology and the capabilities that we're starting to look squarely in the face with our problems around regulatory frameworks, around whether something is a state level decision versus a federal level decision, the relationship between state laws and HIPAA and the like. Um, I can go to certain states that I know of where they have um, health information exchanges, HIEs, that are deeply embedded in working daily with their population of, uh, of healthcare organizations and facilitating real hubs for information exchange that you can layer other things about analytics and value-based care on top of. And then I can go to other states where they say, we're basically a pipe for when a provider has an inquiry. We're not really offering value-based services. 
And those first and foremost aren't necessarily conscious decisions to prevent something from happening. They're working within state frameworks and they're working within um, uh, legislative boundaries for how things have been set up. And the fact that you know we want to apply an international health standard like HL7 for exchanging data when we don't have national standards for just how we're going to do an HIE are really things that at a grassroots level, we have to come together and address for what do we expect out of information exchange? What do we expect our ability to do with our data and, and healthcare services overall? And then look to see what that technology is that's needed and, and probably that technology is in place. So it's kind of a long-winded long answer to, I don't know, but, but I, would, I would challenge the model around, hey, what are we gonna have the systems by first saying, hey, what are we gonna have agreements on, on, on how we agree that we're going to do this legally? Yeah, I mean, I, I would, I'd answer the question, um, I think in a lot of markets, or at least in many of our markets, right, the data, that, much of the data that, you, that someone is looking for is available. And it's more of answering the question, what is the, what is this, what is the problem we want to solve and who's the right person to do it? And so, you know, like it's, and, and this is where the incentives challenge comes in, right? So, you know, like you see it around the edges where a primary care practice all of a sudden wants all of their, the admissions for their, for all of their patients from the last day, all at once in the morning so that their, their office can go through all the Medicare patients and get them in for a follow-up visit because they can check the box on the transitions of care management code, right? And get an extra hundred dollars for that visit when they come in. And so, you know, but there's lots of other examples, right? A managed care organization is is um, very happy to have the most recent phone number for their for their patient for their member, right, from the hospitalization, so they can call them and get them in for a, for a follow up visit, and make sure they're getting follow up care. Um, but like you see it in these where there's value based care kind of arrangements where they really want the data. Um, that's where that's where typically you get the, the biggest bang for the buck. Um, it's more around, you know, what are the use cases and, and how do you refine the data so you're not just dumping data on people, but you're giving them something actionable that they can use and benefit from and, for, and their patients can benefit from. And the last question, we're gonna, and then we'll wrap up here. They're somewhat related, but, you know, the, there's a question one about how, you know, kind of how consumers can be empowered uh, you know, to change the incentives uh, and, and think about that and, and even a more broad question around how do we really get more creative in how we pay for our healthcare? And I'm, you know, I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll close with this, you know, with this little question and, uh, you know, any, would anybody like to lead us off in answering, you know, seeing, if, seeing how those connect? Yeah, I'd, I'd love to throw out a nugget that I heard a while ago in a rural healthcare conversation, um, talking about social determinants of health and incentivization. And, and uh, it's uh, publicly available uh, information on uh, Geisinger's efforts to try and control costs for their high cost population chronic care type 2 diabetes, of which one of the things they analyzed was uh, collecting information from patients just on food security. Uh, and, and their percentage of, of, uh, of consumption of fresh fruits and vegetables. So Geisinger actually made an agreement to provide fresh fruits and vegetables through a, uh, a farm store or the like or something on a regular basis, invested like, I'll throw out $75,000 as an example, the numbers are available publicly, uh, to start delivering fresh fruits and vegetables to, to their, their chronic care patients who are, who are uh, more costly in type 2 diabetes. And they recognized as part of the study like a 35x savings in the cost for those patients just by improving and incentivizing their ability to get fresh fruits and vegetables and changing dietary patterns. So these sorts of things are out there. And I think it highlights, you know, non-traditional ways that, that healthcare organizations can incentivize, uh, you know, or invest in patient behaviors that have, for the long run, and especially for value-based care, pay off as part of that delivery. Yeah, Jim, I, you know, I, I think you've seen Kaiser do some similar things. They're building apartment complex, opening farmers markets, yep, you know, similar exactly. concepts. And I, I think the way that we, we really start to change the dynamics are when 
we do look at it through value-based care, which means we have to we have to earn a certain amount of trust and transparency into every individual patient's life. You know that they're willing to share, um, and we have to earn that. Um, but it allows us to think about alignment. You know, the question I'd have is, you know, is is Kaiser or Geisinger are they the best ones to manage a grocery supply chain? Or is there a way we could bring in the entities that have proven to be experts in that, you know, within, within various industries and align incentives around risk models and shared pools, et cetera, in new and unique ways? And, and I think those are really good examples of where that, that's starting to present. Those questions are being asked. And I, and I think that the answer to those will lead to, um, you, know, some of the, you know, some of the solutions that I think we're all, we're all desiring. <clears throat> Well, I, I want to thank all the panelists, you know, thank you, Rhonda. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Jim, for providing your, your expertise, your experience, uh, your time today. Um, it's been a privilege to get to, to kind of host this and, and pick your brains. Uh, with that, we're going to turn it back over to the folks at Health, and thanks for having us.